Yeah, so um, I could go ahead and start. And um, my name is Mandy Billinge, and I'm the executive director and founder of Kids for the Bay. And uh, really happy to be sharing um, our Blue Watershed Classrooms program with you today. And since we just have a few participants, maybe Laurel and Sienna can introduce themselves and then uh, teachers could say your name and grade level and um, why you're interested in the workshop. Great, yeah, I'm Laurel Sebastian. I'm the education manager at Kids for the Bay. And yeah, I'll be helping uh, lead this workshop with you. And we, we teach mostly third through fifth, but um, we do have programs that extend K through um, K through six as well. Hi everyone, I'm Sienna Kirkendall. Um, I'm also a program manager at Kids for the Bay and I'm really grateful you all are here and I'll help be helping with the workshop as well. So um, Janet, could you go ahead and tell us where you teach and what grade level? Okay, um, so I teach, I'm at Collins Elementary in Panol. Um, I teach third grade. Um, yeah, so I'm just, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not real familiar with Kids for the Bay, but I'm hoping, um, you know, I think part, part of what we're talking about as teachers is as much as possible, you know, bringing real life problems and issues into the classroom. Um, you know, and I know there's, there's issues with, you know, with water and with the environment and all these things that these kids are dealing with and will be dealing with. So, you know, I'm hoping that's, uh, you know, tying that into our curriculum um, would be a really good thing. Definitely, thanks. Um, Rachel, could you tell us a bit more about yourself? Hi everyone. Um, I am the science prep teacher at Torrey Pines Elementary School in San Diego. So I teach science to kids that are from TK to fifth grade once a week. And I am here to get any and all resources. Like Janet said, I love giving them, you know, those real world applications. So to bring, you know, our science lessons to life. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And um, Juanita, would you introduce yourself? Okay, um, I, uh, my name is Juanita Flores Mejia. I teach fifth grade at Ford Elementary. Oh, and um, we've done some um, water trips with, I think we did it with Kids for the Bay before. And then where it was like, we did like, we studied like soil and we talked about the food webs and stuff and how we have kind of like a little bit of a marsh in Richmond. So we went out there with the field trip and stuff like that. So we've done some things in the past when I was at Grant, um, okay. but it's been a little while. Okay, great. So you've done uh, our Watershed Action Program before? Yeah. I think yeah okay wonderful thank you for joining us today um it looks like we have one more person coming so um i'll just continue with my presentation and then we can ask them to introduce themselves afterwards so um kids with a bay is now in our 29th year of operation and we deliver programs throughout Alameda and Contra Costa counties, mostly in person usually, um, but we're happy to be able to connect with people in San Diego outside of our service area through, through Zoom and online distance learning as well. Um, at Kids for the Bay, we believe that everyone is an environmentalist and we have four main goals for our work that help encourage students to become environmentalists. And I'm going to um, share my screen and take you to our website so you can see some pictures of our students in action um, while I'm talking a little bit about our goals. Can everyone see the Kids With Away website here? Okay, great, thanks. So our first goal is to connect uh, students with nature and to get them into the outdoors, both in their local watershed and also on special field trips to Creek, Bay and ocean habitats. And for many of our students, this is one of their first opportunities to visit the ocean or explore the bay or even to explore their local creek in a scientific way with um, environmental education. Um, our second goal is to get our students really excited about hands-on science. 
So we bring a lot of investigations and experiments into the classroom. Um, we also have uh, give our students the opportunity to do observations and data collection in the outdoors. And we bring a lot of equipment like binoculars and field microscopes so that our children can really engage with science in nature in the outdoors. And they quickly learn that they love hands-on science. Um, our third main goal is to empower our students to um, take leadership in terms of environmental action. So they get to do projects together as a class, for example, creek restoration projects, making green pesticides for their school gardens. And then they also take leadership roles like leading school-wide assemblies to teach their whole school about how to take care of the environment, as well as making videos and posters to share with their families and with their school communities. And then also making everyday behavior changes to help the environment as well. I'm gonna stop the screen share. And um, our fourth main goal is to have a lasting impact. And we do this uh, by partnering with teachers and going into the classrooms and working with our teachers. So they get the opportunity to learn alongside our students. And then we have uh, our teacher follow-up support program, which provides resources and equipment for teachers to continue teaching the program themselves as well. And that's what we're going to be talking to you about today is our Blue Watershed Classrooms um, Teacher Follow-Up Support Program. And we'd love to get your feedback since it's a fairly new program that we've been running for just a couple of years. Um, and I think Laurel is going to um, go next with the next part of our uh, workshop today. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. Um, that was a great introduction to Kids for the Bay. And I, um, you know, thinking about one of our key goals being connecting kids to nature, we did just want to ask as kind of an icebreaker question, maybe what is a recent way that you have connected with nature? Because, I mean, I know as the self-selecting group that is here, you might be I'm pretty used to thinking about your connections with nature, but um, I think it's kind of helpful to think about the daily connections we make with nature um, and as a way to kind of inspire ways that students can connect with nature as well. So I, I was curious maybe if, if anyone wants to raise their hand and share, but also if um, you rather you could write um, in the chat, it could really be uh, anything from, you know, noticing something from your window to going on a, a camping trip or anything in between. Um, so I have to actually think of mine though. <laughs> ah, somebody said they recently went on a bike packing trip. Is that Sienna? Nice. Thanks. I, uh, I'll share one uh, that I have been uh, slowly over the past uh, week or two trying to get my garden going for the spring and take get rid of the the straggly leftovers from my kind of winter garden and it's been kind of amusing because I've gone to several uh, nurseries in search of a particular cherry tomato that I love the sun gold cherry tomato and I keep getting there when they're when they oh they're all gone we'll get some more next week and uh, today I had to go to three nurseries this morning but I was finally successful and it was funny there were people at every nursery like looking for the, it was like a, an easter egg hunt or something everybody was searching for the sun gold tomatoes so uh, that sense of spring and everybody getting excited about starting their gardens um, has been fresh in my mind the last week or two great um, I see uh, Jordan just wrote in taking a look at the anatomy of flowers. That's always a fun activity um, and learning about pollination that this week. Uh, that was one of my favorite activities, even from college was doing some flower dissection. So I like that you can go go in depth to different degrees for that. Um, yeah, similarly, I think I've been uh, just spending a little bit more time in the garden um, and just noticing the flowers that are, are blooming, uh, you know, new ones blooming every week. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hike every, I'm a hiker, so I'm hiking out in the East Bay Regional Parks and up on Mount Diablo every weekend, um, and it's been great, you know, the past month or two with all the wildflowers, um, and the only one I could really identify is the poppy, the California poppy, 
and all my friends keep telling me the names of all the other flowers and I, I keep forgetting them. <laughs> <laughs> So who knows, maybe in 10 years, I will remember, you know, the names of all those flowers, but, you know, really pretty to look at. Um, and we're also, we've been talking about, it's still green, it's kind of still green, you know, and we know in a few weeks, it's, it's all going yellow in California, and it's going to be a very dry season, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, really enjoying it right now. Great. Um, does anyone else want to share before we move on? I would say I've also been working in the garden too. So we have like a little garden in our backyard, but then I'm also in charge of the, the school's garden. Since we haven't had any kids, I didn't plan a ton this year because we had went crazy last fall and put a whole bunch of stuff in it. And then in the spring, it was like no one to eat it. So we just end up cleaning it all out and then like just maintaining the trees that we have. And um, the other thing was like, it's been getting darker later and later. So we were only doing like morning walks with our dog, morning walks. Well, we've been able to go down to the um, Richmond Marina and walk more like in the evening where it's, you know, still really nice because it's been warm and it's been getting dark later. So that's been good too. That's great. Thanks for sharing. I see that we, um, Constance, you joined us. If you're interested in sharing, we were just warming up with a question of a way that you've connected with nature recently in any and small or large way. Oh yeah, of course. Hi, it's good to see everyone. Hey, Teresa. And um, check this out. Um, we have our garden. We made new garden bins in the school. So today the children were out putting the sprouts in that uh, there was a whole keg of them. And we're trying to hurry up and get them in there before they got dried out. We've also made plans for summer so that uh, we can actually uh, maintain the garden in the summertime, which was the first time ever. And mm -hmm. it's all volunteer from our uh, Prescott uh, first fruits program, which is our PTA. Mm -hmm. uh, so then it worked out really well. So we've been doing that pretty much every Tuesday we have a garden meeting. So, and I'll be there Saturday as well. So we're, we're starting off pretty good. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for sharing. I think that all of those are great examples of, um, you know, I find myself thinking about, sure, I do like to camp and really get far out in nature or in the environment, but also thinking about how can students connect every day with yeah sprout in the garden or just noticing a raven from their from their yard um, and so uh thanks for sharing some some thoughts and we did want to jump into modeling some of the activities that we actually do with the students um we were planning on doing a breakout group but i wonder um sienna if you have thoughts with a smaller group if it makes sense to do one group or would you prefer to go ahead and do a breakout I think we could probably just stay as a whole group since we're a smaller group for that. Um, yeah, I can share my screen and leave that. So we have an activity that we do in one of our early lessons and is a part of the curriculum in the first um, Blue Watershed Classrooms lesson, this program's lesson. Um, and it's called our Virtual Watershed Scavenger Hunt. Um, and it's a great activity to do over Zoom if you're you know, together in a in that way, or you could do it in the classroom in person. And then we often follow it up depending on the situation with encouraging students to do their own scavenger hunt, like in their own neighborhood or in their backyard or from their window, if that's the option. Um, and if you're in person with students, you could also go out on the school campus and explore around or perhaps walk to a neighboring park. But I'm gonna share my screen and I thought we could engage with it. Um, the way that we typically share with young people that we work with, um, again, are you seeing my uh, Kids for the Bay? There's like a, a slides. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Always got to check. <laughs> um, so this is a slides presentation we've created with this virtual watershed homepage. And you'll notice that there's- If you can put it in present mode, we could see it a little bigger, but if it's easier for you to keep it in this mode, that's okay too. We see the um, desktop version. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. I'm going to put it in present mode, but I just wanted to sort of highlight how it's um, created so teachers get a sense and then we'll, we'll kind of model it. But it is a slides presentation. So there's like a home page that when you put it on present view, it will link to other slides that are connected to these features. So I'll actually do that now on present view. And so normally we ask students, again, this is sort of tailored towards third through fifth grade, but you could scaffold up and down and edit the slides as you choose. But basically each of these items here on the homepage of the virtual watershed is clickable. 
So you can choose an item. Once you click it, it will link to another slide. You can investigate, ask questions, learn about it, read fun facts, and then you can return to the home page and keep exploring. So often when we do this, we'll do this in breakout rooms, um, whether those be like two teacher-led breakout rooms where the teacher shares their screen and does the sort of clicking around with student suggestions. Um, also, you can do it all together in a main session like this. Or for older students, sometimes we have students lead their own breakout rooms and like a student chooses to screen share and be kind of the like leader. So I thought if anyone wants to explore any features of our watershed, we like to highlight that there's, you know, natural things that are part of the watershed as well as like built and human made components of our environment. And we can take turns sort of choosing something and learning about what's going on here. So would anyone like to start us off? Can we close on the white tree that's underneath the regular tree? Uh, here, Constance? Isn't there like a white tree underneath it? Oh, I think that's actually, yeah, it's just a shadow, actually. Oh, it's not something to click? Yeah. I oh, I'm sorry, that's a meter sharing. <laughs> there, the pollution is <laughs> something clickable, though. OK. I was kind of looking at that rain cloud. Was there something about weather over there? Yeah, there is, there oh, is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Constance, would you be willing to read for us something from the slide? Oh, um, the water cycle. Oh, good. Um, carries water from the ocean to air. Am I reading the right thing? Yeah, that's great. Um, to clouds, to rain, and then to rivers that go back to the ocean. That is perfect. This is what I want. Make a okay. motion, okay? Make a motion for each step. So what does that mean that they have to like move? Is it to invite them to move their body? Yeah, this is a great opportunity. You can like have a student stand up and if folks wanna do that now, also feel free to stay seated, be comfortable. But often like a teacher will model or if students are familiar with the water cycle and already maybe have associated movements, they can come up with their own. But typically we do like a cloud clap for condensation and you can ask students to unmute and practice that vocabulary word like, you know, a rainfall for precipitation, a percolation, I do like wormy fingers of water flowing into the soil, and then evaporation, the opposite movement. And you can like do it on it like super speedy, like, okay, condensation, precipitation, percolation, evaporation, and just sort of make ah, it silly. Yeah. 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 So thanks for being the first person to choose. And once you've like explored a concept or if students have connections, you can, you know, linger as long as you want. But then you can click on the bottom left corner and that will return you to like the watershed homepage and you can keep exploring and learning more. So I want to welcome anybody else if there's like something you're like interested in, in looking at and learning about at this time. Um, I really like going exploring the fish and crab if you want to click on those. Yeah, sure. Would you like to read anything about the fish and crab? Sure, I can read the striped bass fun facts. Um, the largest striped bass found in the San Francisco Bay weighed 78 pounds, which I often connect with students um, being about 78 pounds depending on the grade. And so they, they can really relate to that. Um, and making, and then the next one says, what do you think striped bass eat? What do you think eats striped bass? So having students guess, connecting it to food chains. And I'm usually kind of connecting to the idea that you would have to eat a lot of smaller fish or shrimp or other animals in the bay to be able to get up to, you know, 80, uh, an 80 pound fish. Thanks, Laurel. Yeah, there's also included here, you can see for the crab, there's like a little math problem. This is a great opportunity to do more movement if we wanna do fishy faces for younger students or like dactyl claws, if you're with me, come and pinch me as a teacher. You know, just like working with it however you want, connecting it to other concepts that you're, you're working with students on. Uh, I always have a lot of students who are like, oh yeah, I love to go fishing. I love to eat striped bass or like, I really enjoy Dungeness crab or I once went to San Francisco and had crab in a you know, crab dish or something. So it can bring up a lot of nice connections for students of how they are connected to the watershed. And some of our slides in particular have like more of those action oriented. So I just wanna highlight like the recycling one. These are the five R's that we share with students, daily behaviors that you can practice to reduce pollution and waste. A great conversation like, do you use a reusable water bottle? Or do you have a garden and compost in your backyard? And just a great conversation piece. 
We also have some that I believe this one, the storm drain system, um, sort of relating that differently to our, excuse me, our sewer system and then the storm drain system and talking about how pollution is moving as well as the impacts of pollution on animals and other creatures. Um, and then we also have this one for the pesticides. We have like an actual recipe linked. So students wanna make their own natural pesticide recipe. There's additional links within the presentation. So yeah, something to explore, something like we'd recommend as a teacher to like kind of click around and maybe decide on things that you wanna focus on. I've also had a lot of experiences with students where we only have so much time in a lesson to do this together, but they wanna click on it and explore it later. So you can make like a copy for each student, you know, to like enjoy and explore. And students could also add to this. Like if they're doing research and learning more about the watershed and they wanna add a slide in, that's also a possibility. And with that being said also, we provide a lot of resources for a part of the Blue Watershed classroom program. Um, and all of them are meant for you to like edit as you see fit for your students. So if you're like reading through that, um, that presentation, the virtual scavenger hunt, you're like, I think there's too many words here or there's not enough or I wanna link an additional resource. Like you make your own copies of everything and then it's yours to edit as you see fit. Um, does anybody have any questions about that particular activity? I had a quick question, Jeff. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful, the slides and the way they link. It's lovely. Um, thanks for sharing that. Do you have any of these resources, particularly you were mentioning like the vocabulary words and things in other languages? Mm, that's a great question. We do not have this resource in other languages. We have some of the worksheets that we'll share with you in Spanish as well, um, but we don't have the majority of things in any other languages. Yeah, it's one question. of the top requests that we get from teachers. So I'm always asking when we talk with partners, in case there's some un, some hidden resources we can we can shine a light on. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we have tried definitely over the years to improve our our English language learners, um, like our slides or our worksheets. Um, all of our presentations over time to give, you know, STEM sentences and everything, but only some of our, mostly our worksheets are in um, other languages. Um, if no one has other questions, I think we were gonna move on to, to diving into a little bit of the logistics of this program. You know, you saw a glimpse of one of the activities and then, um, you know, we have, we can overview all the resources that come with, with doing the Blue Watershed Classroom program. And then I'll take it back over and, um, and show you our main resource, which is a whole slide deck to guide you through all the lessons, whether you're teaching that at home um, or sorry, you know, remotely or whether you're teaching it in the classroom. Um, and as you'll see when Sienna is kind of overviewing all of these um, resources, we did, we tried our best to make them work for distance learning and for in-classroom learning. So hopefully I know some people are in the weird hybrid stage in between or starting to transition to classroom. So hopefully this is um, helpful no matter where you're at currently. Thanks so much, Laurel. So I'm gonna give a brief overview of like the structure of the program. And we have one sort of key document that is helpful for that. Give me a thumbs up if you're seeing Kids for the Bay, Blue Watershed. Okay, great, wonderful, thanks. <laughs> So the purpose, again, as Mandy mentioned, is this program is meant to support teachers that we have either previously worked with or teachers who are really invested in environmental science education with creating watershed-friendly, zero-waste classroom communities with their students. And this is a program that once you begin it, it's like yours to continue year after year and develop the resources as you see fit. So the program overview is that as an organization, as Kids for the Bay, we provide um, each of our Blue Watershed classroom partner teachers with written lesson plans and curriculum materials. We also provide um, teachers with a virtual orientation meeting, which this sort of workshop right now can kind of serve as that for you. So when we finish today, if you're interested in doing this program and accessing the resources, all you have to do is just fill out a very brief like Google survey registration, and then we'll email you all the resources so you can have them. 
Also, if you want to do an additional meeting though, we're super happy to do that. And as you teach the program, we continue to provide support via email or Zoom or whatever way we can. Um, and finally, as a Blue Watershed classroom teacher, you would receive an equipment kit. So we have an activity as a part of the curriculum, which is a litter cleanup. And so we provide the like tongs, like a kitchen tongs, as well as reusable bags for teachers to use with their students in person and in groups. So I wanna show the, a few of the lesson plans and the curriculum materials and Laura will also support with that. But as a Blue Watershed classroom teacher, you would get uh, like a Google Drive folder that has two key subfolders, one of which is the curriculum folder, which I'll click on, and that houses each of the lessons. So as a Blue Watershed classroom teacher, when you sign on, you're committing to teaching four different lessons as well as an action project. And each year we sort of shift the action project. And these lessons are about an hour long. And this is an example of the first lesson. Lesson one is what is a watershed? Sort of an introduction to that. We have the lesson plan written here with the key activities, how to share with students. And you'll notice that there are um, slides sort of noted within and Laurel's going to share this sort of slides presentation that can guide each of your lessons, whether you're in person or teaching via distance. And so the lesson references like which slide to pull up at which time to, to highlight and have a visual for each part of that lesson. And then at the ends of the lessons, there's, you know, distance learning as well as in person, you know, suggestions for materials and handouts to use. Um, and then we also have linked the um, NGSS standards and how the lessons are associated with that. So that's an example of one lesson. And with each lesson, in each lesson folder, there's typically um, like a follow-up uh, worksheet for students to do. So in the first lesson, we encourage you to do what we just did, which is the virtual scavenger hunt. And then an optional follow-up activity, which students could do during class time or at home, is to do their own watershed scavenger hunt around their neighborhood or community. And there's a little activity write-up, supplies and directions for that with audio directions as well. And then the second page actually has the worksheet itself already created. So students could either print it if they have access to a printer, if you're in person, you can print it for them. Or perhaps students can just take a piece of paper and write down what they see, observe, draw a picture of what they're noticing in their own watershed. So that's the general program overview. Again, as a Blue Watershed classroom teacher, you would commit to teaching four one-hour engaging lessons that we have lesson plans and materials for you, as well as leading an action project. This year's action project is um, a poster making project where students you know, decide something that they really connected with in the curriculum and want to teach others about and make either a hand-drawn poster or a digital poster. And then we often have like a poster presentation to like a family member or post it in your window or share it with your teammates. Um, and then in addition to that, we just ask for your feedback. Participating in the program, like Mandy said, it's a newer program and we wanna improve it, make it more meaningful and accessible. And so after each lesson, we have a short survey. Um, and then we also have like a, a final evaluation survey when you've completed the program. And upon completion of the program, once you've turned in your survey and taught the lessons in the action project, you're entered in to win um, a prize drawing where we actually would come in person if that's possible. And Kids for the Bay educators would lead a, like a hands-on experience with your students if you were to win. And or if it was via distance, we would lead a Zoom workshop with your class. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions? It's kind of a lot of information, um, but documents like this with like a program overview are housed in the folder that you would receive. So if we go back here to this folder that you would download and have, that's all under teacher preparation, like all the details with everything hyperlinked and then the curriculum separate. Juanita, go ahead. My question is this, so you said it was four one hour lessons. Is there a way to like make them 45 minutes? Cause right now our science mm. block is 45 minutes. What, is it something that could be 45 minutes or should we like have like maybe just do it over five days or what, what do you think would work best? 
That's a great question. Um, this program is really meant to be a support for you. So you're welcome to sort of modify, ideally around that sort of one hour range, I think is like how we plan the curriculum to fit, but it's really up to you. You wanna take the parts that serve you, adapt it to your time model. You're welcome to split the lessons as well if you wanted to do you know, a 30 minute lesson one day and do the second half of lesson one another time. Um, yeah, it's really open to what works for you. And same with all the curriculum materials. Since you would be downloading this folder and perhaps re-uploading it to Drive if that's what you're working in, you can edit things, you know, add in different resources, connect it with curriculum you're already working with, you know, weave it in in the way that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Hi, um, I sort of had the same thing. I Thank you for that. Good question, um, Ms. Uh, Willard Sienna. And um, it is that we have a really robust boss kind of yeah. science going on anyway. I've done this, by the way. I've done this with, with you guys maybe eight years ago or something yeah. like that. I have pictures too. It's so, so crazy that I had found those pictures and put them in my thing. But um, it was a really good program. And um, what I'm curious about is the time length. Is there mm -hmm. like a time length to it? Um, can I start in start in the school year fall? Do I have to turn everything in by um, when? Do I have to turn everything in? Or thanks, Constance. That's a great program, and I'm so glad to hear that you've already been connected with Kids for the Bay previously. Um, in terms of that, normally we do our recruitment for Blue Watershed classrooms, you know, the end of the year prior or in the early fall of the school year. So you can turn in your registration come September or so, October, and then you can begin teaching it right then. But also if it like aligns better with your like scope and sequence for the year to do it in the spring, you're welcome to do it then. You know, we want this again to be supportive. And then the only sort of time, um, sort of constraint is that normally we do the prize drawing um, in like March or April. So oh, if you have finished the program by then and you want to be entered into the opportunity to win like a Kids for the Bay educator led experience, that mm -hmm. would be a deadline. But if you're if you're like, oh, I don't really worry about this prize, you know, I wanna be able to teach it when it makes more sense a little later in the spring, that's also fine. We just want your like feedback and final survey by the end of the school year, like end of May. And you're talking free, aren't you? Yes. Free, oh. free, 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 free. <laughs> free, 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 free. Yes. Yeah, ticking all, ticking, you're ticking all my boxes. And then, yes, of course. <laughs> um, it could, uh, I found it better to do it during the environments module, actually. Mm. It really piggybacked really well yeah. because I still have the binder from last time and I still pull stuff from there, except they brought live, you know, like, like the dead fish from the, yeah. The and the children loved it. And I, I wanted to try to do that again. So thank you. That's really good. I'm glad, Constance. Yeah. I also want to share that, like, you know, depending on where you are, you may also be eligible from for some of our programs that we as Kids for the Bay educators like lead and come and visit the classroom or visit virtually. Right. So we can talk one on one if you're like, actually, I would love for that support as well and see like if that program works and if we have the funding to provide that in your school. Yeah, um, we're right there. We're right where we need to be proximity wise for a lot of stuff. And I'm already thinking like, oh, yeah, we can walk over and make a walking trip to blah, blah, blah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Yeah. So just be in touch with us and, you know, we can set you up with whatever program seems best for you. But this program is free and open to anyone who, you know, just has a short orientation with us and is invested in doing this work with their students. I, yeah. have, I have just a quick question. Um, it's such a robust set of materials that you've put together. It's so impressive. Um, is there anything in there about specific watersheds? So if I'm mm -hmm. in, you know, in, in uh, Connie school in, in West Oakland, or I'm in Janet school up in, in uh, West Contra Costa County, you know, can I look and see what, you know, what watershed our particular school is in? Yeah, that's it. We actually found a really great, I think Laurel found this for us this year, this awesome like Alameda County watershed map, which I imagine means there's other ones for other maps. I can try to pull that up real quick, but then you can like, you know, research where you land and show students. It's really interactive and clickable. It looks like a cool, colorful puzzle <laughs> of all these little puzzle pieces of the watershed. 
Um, so I'm going to search for that momentarily. Um, and I don't mean to throw you off. It's just great to know it exists yeah. and we could connect and share with that. And I'm sure that that, it, that we could find it for West Contra Costa as well, because I think that ties in so well with the NGSS idea of really making things as local and community connected as possible. And so I love that there's that way to really say watershed isn't this abstract thing. Like we're all in a watershed. Which watershed are we in? But it all goes to this bay that we all share. So I love that. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Teresa, for that question, that suggestion. And also for you, um, is it Jordan or Rachel or both? <laughs> Sorry, it's my school account, so they always flip the name for some reason. It's oh. uh, my first name is Rachel. Okay, great. Um, Rachel, for you, for instance, like our materials that we have designed currently are like really Bay Area oriented, but you know, swapping out like a satellite map of your local water, you know, there's all these ways that you can modify and make relevant to your local place too. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, of course. And I found the watershed map and can um, share it when, when I start to talk to you. Are there any other questions before I can share one more resource? Janet, did you have a question? Um, well, one of the questions was Teresa's question, so thank you. Because I know when you go to Tilden Park in the, um, the entry there, they actually have this sort of, this map of the watershed for you know our region here in Contra Costa. But, it would be nice because we're not we're near the Pinole Creek where we can walk to the bay. Um, so the other question is just in terms of you said it's for about third through fifth grade. So are there materials differentiated for grades, or basically you give us materials and we can kind of differentiate ourselves depending on the age of our students? Yeah, that's a great question, Janet. It's the latter. Um, yeah, so you kind of choose and mix and match for what you want for your students. I think. We've discovered that a lot of um, ways to sort of scaffold up, it, particularly in virtual, is like giving students more independence, like in breakout rooms for fifth graders rather than third graders. Third graders were often doing like a teacher-led breakout or a more like guided activity. And with the fifth graders, we found that the resources we've created, a lot of them are like really excited to kind of be in that leadership role and sort of they know the technology better than us. They're just like leading the breakout rooms, clicking around, making their own, you know, scavenger hunts on slides and, so yeah, I think it works well for that full age range and you just, you know, again, know your students best and pick and choose or decide how to scaffold. But also within our lesson plans, we have some sort of notes around like how to do the activity in a few ways. Great, well, I could share my screen now and the most important resource of all we haven't dug into yet. So that's what we wanted to, to end on and that is our full slide deck of, um, yeah, the slides that go with all the lessons. Um, so I'll go ahead and share that and then we can continue um, with any questions that we have. And this will give you um, kind of a, a good, hopefully a strong view of the full program. I think I'll keep it out of present mode just so, um, cause there are so many slides I'm not gonna go you know through the four hour lessons, but I'll just kind of hop around a little bit. Um, but you know, this is the slide deck that'll be in that main uh, folder, Google folder that we share with you. Um, and the, the, all the lessons are in one place. So you'll have all, um, here's our table of contents, all for roughly one hour lessons. And then the, some, some guidance for the action project, um, which like we said this year is mostly about educational posters um, or environmental posters. And then there's a few slides at the end on reflecting, maybe making some sort of environmental pledge about you know, what they've learned. Um, so to go, just to give an overview of the flow, that first lesson that we've talked most about is about what is a watershed. So that's where they're kind of exploring the virtual watershed. Um, and you'll see, well, first I'll overview all the lessons and then I'll give you a little bit more of an in-depth um, view. So there's what is a watershed and then a little bit more about the storm drains and pollution and our connections to environments, like how do our cities connect with environments um, or you know bays, rivers. And then the third lesson is a, a trash cleanup, which you know if you are in person, we usually use that that hour in itself to do a trash cleanup. Um, the lesson four is about the five R's, so that kind of reduce, reuse, recycle idea um, and how we're, how we can reduce waste um, or do, reduce pollution, you know, uh, make more of a positive impact on our environment. And then they would wrap up with that action project. 
but I do want to give kind of an overview. These slides are really, um, they vary a lot. And some of them you'll find are probably a better fit for in person and some maybe are better fit for virtual. And, and for that reason, there might even be a little bit of redundancy here and there. Like, um, you know, maybe if you're in person, you just want to put up a picture of the environment and ask them what the, what the environment is and have a discussion. I, if I'm teaching um, virtually, I always share this slide about what is the environment and have and write in all these ideas um, that students can see as they add their ideas in. Maybe they come in from the chat or students sharing. Um, so there's, yeah, places to add um, things in. We have tried to make it pretty easy to find these resources. So you'll notice some cross linking like in that main guiding document that Sienna shared um, that links to this presentation. And then this presentation also links here. It's underlined because this links to that virtual watershed. Um, and there's some embedded things like here's an embedded video that's really just like w one minute on what is a watershed. And I find it helpful to kind of break it down with, with students. Um, so again, works for in-person or virtual. Um, and then they dig a little bit more into things like what is, you know, an estuary and and talking more about um, our watersheds. This is a good spot to um, share. And and I guess something else to note is that there there are some notes in the speaker's notes. So for example, this is just having the students think about how little watersheds can connect and add together, kind of like puzzle, smaller puzzle pieces of a larger puzzle. Um, to make a bigger watershed. So maybe, for example, I live in that small Temescal Creek watershed, but I'm also part of the, the San Francisco Bay watershed. And that, that map is linked here for Alameda County. I have been meaning to link in the resource for Contra Costa. It's not quite as user friendly, but it's definitely um, a helpful map to, to figure out your own watersheds. But for example, for this, you can actually click around to all the different watersheds in Alameda County. Um, and you can even click and learn more about different watersheds. So that's a good additional resource to dig a little bit deeper. You know, this I think will share the history of the area and even restoration projects. And there's so there's definitely um, space to go a lot deeper. But even if you just wanted to do a, a little view of some tributaries that go into a larger river and out to the bay, that sort of um, conversation. And then, oops, that's the wrong one. I have to move this. Um, so that's a lot of the first lesson. The last, the first lesson ends on um, exploring some maps. And this is where if you were in person, you know, maybe you would want to um, print this worksheet that's in that lesson one folder and have students and print the map and have students actually match. Um, I guess this is more of a of the matching slides where you have them match their own city with a satellite image, um, you know, they could draw on the piece of paper. And that's often what you'll, that's what you'll see described in the, the curriculum. But since that's hard to do online, we've also made a, a slightly edited version of that where um, students can compare on their computers, um, like, where is the San Pablo Bay? I usually have students kind of examine the maps and hold up with their fingers, which number is the San Pablo Bay on this satellite map. And then so they're kind of looking, trying to find that word, kind of trying to compare sh the shapes of the different maps. And then once I've gotten a lot of students, you know, holding up a, a number one, I can actually drag that label over here. Um, and so they can learn about the major water bodies, a few of the cities. And again, you can customize this right now. It just says our city, but maybe you have them placed wherever they live. Um, and again, you know, in San Diego, yeah, you could, you would probably have to edit it for, for a different city, but you could hopefully, um, this would inspire, uh, inspire you to give, get a start on that kind of lesson. Um, then lesson two is going more, I guess at the end of it, each lesson, you'll see some sort of, sort of at home activity that it could be an extension, you know, you could do that together as a class or, um, or they can do it on their own time. So it, for this first lesson, we even gave two options. Um, like Sienna mentioned the second option where they do a watershed scavenger hunt at home, or again, you could do that together at school. Uh, lesson two is more about storm drains. You'll notice every lesson starts off with some objectives. So this one's um, thinking more about watershed health and our connections from cities to 
um, two different waterways. Um, there's some just, you know, pictures to kind of examine, have students notice um, different things, um, different ways that pollution moves in our environment, for example. Um, again, some embedded videos. And then lesson three is the litter cleanup where, you know, if you're together in class, you would probably just go over the rules of being safe, you know, not touching sharp things, um, keeping our hands clean, that sort of thing, and go out together and clean the campus. Or we have had a lot of success this year actually inviting students to go out, um, you know, with their parents' permission and, and, and um, using these rules to do a little mini cleanup right outside of their house or in a park near their homes. Um, and then the last lesson is a lot about those um, five R's. So again, there's slides to kind of guide that whole conversation about, you know, where is our garbage going and how to, and what does it mean to, uh, I guess, prevent waste um, and use the five R's. Um, and this was, you know, another, we've tried to make them somewhat interactive for, so for this one, for example, um, I always have the students get up and run around their room and try to find things that relate to the five R's. Like, does anyone, I guess, in the in the workshop right now have an example? You could, um, if there's anything around you that's reusable or could be composted or could be recycled, anything that you wanna um, share with the group briefly. Yeah, I always have them run around and get up and then like maybe hold up their items. I see a lot of, all of us have our water bottles nearby. Right. Um, so having them really connect with what do those words mean? How is it, you know, for example, uh, a water bottle, if you're using reusing a water bottle, are you also reducing use, the use of plastic bottles? Um, does anyone have another example of anything that's near near them now? I know I've been uh, talking a lot. Anything that's reusable or recyclable? I don't know. Hmm. My students the other day were just talking about someone got a book and was like, I got a book from the library, so it's reusable and I return it and I share it with other people so I don't throw it away when I'm done. <laughs> you know, um, examples like that. Um, oh yeah, Janet, you have an example. Yeah, reusable, a reusable pouch, um, thinking about. Uh, yeah, I, I, and sometimes if I want to go further, I even talk about um, you know, we at the top of this kind of, it's almost like a, an order of operations. We're always trying to reduce and refuse and reuse, reuse. And then if we're left with some waste, we can try to compost it, try to recycle it and whatever's left, it gets, you know, sent to the landfill. Um, so I think I'll mostly leave it at there. Again, there you'll see if there's the kind of worksheets here that you wouldn't you wouldn't do this worksheet you know virtually but it's kind of reminding you that it's a resource um, there or you can use it as an idea okay get out a piece of paper and write down one of the five r's and draw a picture about how to use it so again there's a few options for how you can kind of engage students on a on a lot of these um, topics uh, and then the last thing i wanted to share is that there are some resources at the end here um, of, or just uh, the, for the action project, there's some example posters um, and some guidelines for the posters. Um, and I think these are fun to see, you know, students come up with a lot of different ideas of um, the, you know, reducing pollution, keeping their environment clean. These, the student wrote about the five R's. This student did a poster about, you know, what, what can go to the landfill, what could be composted, what could be recycled. So really what, whatever they want to do, or if you want to give a more specific prompt. I think I will end it there because I do want to leave time for questions. Um, does anyone have any questions about, again, that's just our, the main resource of the slide deck and hopefully you can use it whether you're in, um, in class or not. I'll just share an observation. I know many of the teachers um, that we work with across the districts here in the East Bay use um, FOSS and they use the practice of science notebooks. And so I noticed a lot of the examples that you had for student worksheets or some of the prompts on the slides would carry really well to be prompts for um, use in their student science notebooks for writing or drawing and connect in with their um, ongoing science and the data collection and and the um, reflections on what they've learned. So I think you you provide a lot of great prompts 
um, that can be used in different ways. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, you can really uh, make it your own with the, depending on how you want them to yeah, turn in a worksheet or put it in their notebook or whatever works best for your, your classroom. Just like Sienna said that, you know, that's a big emphasis we want to make clear is that you can always, um, once you, you know, download, download and make your own copy, you can really um, edit the slides to however, however it works best for your class. Are there any other questions? Oh yeah, Janet? Um, so yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm just wondering, so once you, you know, register and you get all the materials and you get the slide deck, I mean, is that pretty, much it can you use the same materials every year or does it it sounds like maybe the action project changes you know do you get new materials every year i was just wondering if it yeah once you have it if that's it and you just keep using the same thing over and over for your new classes yeah you i think you certainly could we'll probably always you know be learning like we are taking hopefully getting surveys back from teachers and improving it over the years um, we do plan to add in different action projects, but you know, if you really like the poster making, that could probably work multiple years as well. Um, and so that's where we usually try to keep in touch with teachers and and have them register and kind of know, okay, who is participating, who who might want um, us to check in with them half way through the year and see how it's going, that sort of thing. Um, so usually we have teachers re-register and we can share new files with you, but also you could continue. Um, to use the, the older versions as well, probably perfectly fine. And, and that seems like the perfect prompt for me to let all of you teachers know. Um, I know they will drop into the chat the information about how you can sign up and register. And if you want to get direct information from the um, Kids for the Bay program, um, please do uh, share your contact information with them because, you know, we even though we partner with people on these things through the OCRS promises our teachers, we always um, protect their information and let our teachers sign up for what they want. Um, so this is a perfect opportunity for you if you want to get this information directly from kids from the Bay as well, um, or be updated. You've done the program one year, maybe Janet, you do it this, this coming year, and you want to get the updates the following year. This is a great time to remind you to sign up directly with them. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, I know Sienna just put that um, the registration link in the chat. So that would just ask you a couple of great uh, questions about your grade level and your contact information. Um, and then, yeah, we can send you the information. You could be you could start teaching it this year or wait till next year. Um, and of course, it's not it's not binding to register. Um, and then and it is, you know, still free, but it definitely shows us your interest. So we follow up. And then I just put in our email at the bottom there. That's kind of our general email um, on our website. You'll see we all have specific emails as well, but school programs at kidsforthebay.org is a good place to start if you have questions. And I love the opportunity with the, um, with the ability to reach teachers beyond our immediate geographic area. So having a teacher here from Torrey Pines from San Diego is, is lovely and I, I could imagine um, going forward, maybe an opportunity for you to create some kind of a kids for other bays, you know, and, and sort of be able to link, you know, have if, if another teacher made that kind of a great map for showing the watershed of the San Diego Bay or some other bay, being able to have some, some way on maybe on your website or something to, to um, connect and share those things. It would be a great, a great way to show that greater connection to the big oceans that we are all ultimately connected to. So I love that opportunity. I also wanted to share that we love to work with grade level teams of teachers. So if you have partner teachers in your grade level who might also be interested, we really encourage you to get a grade level team together and then you can support each other and do special projects together and all the students at the grade level will, will get this program. Um, and also we do highlight our teacher partners on our website, on our Blue Watershed Classrooms showcase page. And we uh, provide certificates as well to, to recognize your efforts that you can display in your classroom to share that you are a Blue Watershed Classrooms uh, teacher. So if we have a partner teacher, how would we like, cause they clearly missed the orientation. So is there gonna be another orientation they can go to or, I mean, how would they, how would they be able to? 
it's mm -hmm. best if they if you come to the orientation together so you can set up a time to to meet together with the kids with a bay educator who is working with you yeah, and Juanita, in your case, since you have attended this, like, unless you have additional qu questions and like, you don't have to join that meeting necessarily, but if you want to share the registration link with your partner teacher, if they send in a registration, we will contact them and set up like a, a 15 to 30 minute, like just Zoom meeting with one of us. Like it doesn't have to be a set time. We can work with their schedule. Okay, thank you. And yeah. we will be um, sharing the recorded version of this PD. So this could also serve as if you had a partner teacher, if they were able to view the recording and then register, um, they might be up to speed <laughs> by doing that as well. And I'm gonna put into the chat, the other um, CRS resources um, for all of you. And I know that you probably already have them. And just in case, hopefully you've bookmarked them, the distance learning resources, the climate literacy uh, and environmental science resources and all of the updates about what our local science centers and partners are doing and offering. And we will spend this summer updating all of that again as everybody figures out what the fall will look like and what programs will be offered and available for teachers. And we imagine that over the next school year, it's going to be something that changes and evolves over the school year. And we will work to keep everybody updated and including Kids for the Bay. So you keep us posted and <laughs> we'll keep teachers posted about how your offerings are um, changing as our situations continue to change. Great. Thank you so much, Teresa, for organizing this. And thank you every, everyone for you know, attending and participating and asking questions. I'm definitely happy to, to continue to stay on for a couple minutes if you think of any, any questions. But uh, yeah, it does look like we're at five o'clock and we managed to kind of cover everything by then, which is good. 